I hear myself. If, if, I, if I get tired of the microphone, I'll put it off and I'll just shout. Anyone can hear me? Any questions? Anyone? Um, I, will f I might forget this after, but after me, there is a change in program and you've got Marcin presenting instead of Camille. The printed version is wrong, the app is correct. And I'll, I'll, have I'll repeat this again uh, just before the end of the session. Uh, I'm Pete, nice to meet you guys. Uh, it's my uh, second or third time in Riga, but this is the first time I get to present here. I like, I'm one of the Oracle guys. Uh, this is what you get uh, from working with Oracle too much. This is the way to fix that. And, and these are some of my customers. If you want your name or your company on this list, give me a call. We, we can arrange that. This is what I've done for a while. It looks glamorous. It's not. It's just you know drinking a lot of coffee most of the time. Um, I'm going to tell you about uh, some weird feature in Oracle. And there are two lessons in this PowerPoint, actually. And the one is that if you build an application, you know, you're, you're good to do stuff in the database, but don't make it too complicated. We have some examples of that. And then one of my colleagues found a brilliant fix for a feature that shouldn't have a bug in the first place. Uh, there's a bit of history. We investigated. This is for the Oracle nerds. We used AWR. Uh, the approach was layers, layers, and layers. You have to sort of dig into the layers all the time. As app developers like layers, I'm mm, sort of, yeah. Uh, the result cache, who, who knows what, what is meant with a cache? A ca everyone familiar with what cache is, sort of? You know, it's keeping data somewhere close to your code so you can access it quickly. Yeah. Um, the Oracle result cache at first didn't work. We had a perfect use case and it didn't work, and we have to figure out why. Uh, we fixed it. At the end of this, this is the nice one. I want you to go home and, and find out what n is. You know, there is a magic number. Above n, it doesn't work. Below n, it works. What's n? And there was one, one uh, a couple of months ago, uh, one person in the audience actually opened uh, a service request with Oracle, and Camille came back to say, you know what they did? They opened a service request with Oracle to find out the number. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a secret. Um, if I have time left, and I'll probably run over time, I'd like to discuss one of the reasons I talk here is I want to know what people think of it all and what kind of reactions I get. So we had an application, and it ran on Exadata, and it wasn't good enough basically. That's the so we had a slow screens, slow everything, even slow materialized views. And materialized views are the magic bullet in Oracle. You, you can pre-query stuff. Even that didn't help. We used Kiwi. Who knows Kiwi? Kill it with iron. Put more hardware on. It didn't work. Okay. Um, the user operation still suffered, users complain. Management want a root cause analysis. If you ever come across a Linux system and, in, and you find uh, this file, that's probably me. I was there and there is some hello joke world in there that says, yep, we found a root cause analysis because management wanted something. Um, but you have to start by observing your system because it worked fine in dev. Riga dev days, you get the hint? Nah. So we investigate. Basically, what we had was CPUs going through the roof. Um, OEM, the Oracle tool, told us. Lab128 told us. The AWRs told us we had a, a CPU problem. The DB CPUs, 92% of the time, everything was on the CPU. The system did nothing but calculate, basically running on the CPU. Um, so findings, what have we got? Um, we found out that we had executes of, this is an extract from an AWR, we had a few queries executing 10,000 times in a second, that sort of thing. AWR numbers went through the roof, and the question was to the application guys, why do you execute so often? And their answer was, we don't. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, and uh, that uh, it was a valid answer, by the way. So we, we start to investigate. We have a rich application. It uses views. Who's familiar with the concept of a view? Sort of. Oh, good. You guys use databases. That's good. Um, we had a generated code. So basically, the developer had no clue what the code was like. The code was the result of pressing a button, and then the application gen generated its own code. 
Uh, we had instead off triggers, meaning we had logic under views, which is valid, but it does need calculation. The views were using functions, the functions were in packages. We had select and where clauses calling functions all the time. We had a lot of functions of the name get something of my thingy with a thing ID and return a string. So it was basically retrieving strings all the time, 10 thousands per second, and, and no amount of hardware can, can go that fast. Uh, we were querying objects, literally. There was a view called objects. Under that view, one, three, six tables. So uh, a query to that view potentially had to go through 136 tables all the time. Let me try and explain that. Layers. And this slide is only the database. There is application logic on top of it, but I'm not going into that at this point in time. So I have a view with tables, and above that is a view. I have about 2,000 other tables, and there also there's also views on top of that. The total amount of objects in this thing was huge. It was a 6,000 views and a 2,000 tables and uh, yeah, uh, views. Above those views, I have packages, stored procedures. Who, who uses stored code in the database? Transact, SQL, PLC? You got Oracle guys in the room. Oh, I, I could have kept more Oracle content in. Anyway, I have a layer of packages, and basically the packages call the view. The packages query the views. On top of the packages, I have views again. So I have a view querying a function in a package. The function calls another, queries another view, and that view looks at a table. I've got layers. Ooh. And above those views, I have screens, people looking at data, and, and a lot of the data is character strings. Some of them are live translated from Norwegian to English or vice versa. Very flexible. And I have reports looking at views. Reports were slow, so somebody thought, well, maybe I should put some M views in. Anyone familiar with the concept of materialized views? Oh, good. Oh, I can... Guys, we can do this presentation. Okay, um, I was afraid I would get like Java people in the room wanting to do Ruby stuff. Um, the, the main problem was in these packages. I have views here querying functions in a package, querying views. Um, looks a bit like this. I have a view which selects get something using ID, call it attribute, from table. The table actually is a view. And in the WHERE clause, I have a function again. This is generic. This is potentially a very powerful system. And it was. The, the logic, the, the science, and the, 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 how do you say, the functionality inside this system is daunting. The total content was less than 50 gigabyte. The, the logic and the, and the amount of clever people who were building, who had built this and who were now using this was amazing. Um, some of them were in... in not in Krakow, in Katowice, by the way, in a, in a service center. One of my uh, team leads to, uh, that, that was, used, was complaining about this was a Polish woman from uh, Katowice, and she wrote a thank you mail to my boss. Uh, thank you. It's like, uh, thank you is Jin Kuyen in Polish, I think. Apologies. What you have is a function call here, meaning it does work. A function call needs to do work. A function call, it needs to do work. This is where the CPU burn comes from. This is why this little CPU guy is running so fast. And then you join, you know, you got like two views, join them together, and the join condition are two function calls. This is getting deadly heavy on the CPU. Okay, so function, call, function calls and function calls, my battery is also giving away. No, um, and it just, just keeps, on, keeps on running function calls and function calls. Uh, you get the picture by now. If you put this in the explain plan, like Heli probably showed you an explain plan of a query, it says, ah, you've got a table and a key and an argument. Oh, this will be something like an index and a lookup. You know, explain it and it looks really good. Three gets, a very good explain plan. And people think, oh, it's a good explain plan, nothing wrong with that. Uh -uh. Auto trace it and you see thousands of gets because actually there's a function in there that causes a lot of other queries to fire that you don't see in the first explain. 
think about that. No. So <laughs> here's my system at work. <laughs> um, the first solution for this, this stuff is, can I cache more? And it actually, most of the stuff was already in cache. This system did no I.O. You know, remember the AWR summary at, at the front? It was all CPU. There was no I.O. Um, another problem with caching is the data would change underneath it. When we asked them, like, can you pre-query this? Can you put it in, a, in an array? And the answer was, no, actually, we can't because we think the data changes while it is being used. When the system is under heavy use, is exactly the moment where you don't want anything cached because data changes. Uh, caching in an array, it would require more code, it would require more intelligence. Uh, if you build your own caching mechanism, you defy the asset property of the database. Anyone, d don't be ashamed, who is not familiar with the concept of asset? Don't worry, okay? Uh, make a note and Google it for a developer. It, it uh, I realize a lot of developers don't really want to know about ACID, but it, it will ex it's pretty useful at some point in time. So what we tried to use was the function result cache, and it didn't work. And this is where my colleague went, what the fuck, Did I have the perfect use case for function result, and it doesn't work. The guy's name was Peter Sweer, some of the Dutch people may know him. Um, and he found out, first, it doesn't work. We thought about it for a day or so, and he came in to work one morning and said, I think I know, I, I think I know why, and I think I know huh. And that's why the quiz comes in. I want you guys to go and figure out what N is. Okay. Uh, so there were a couple of more solutions. One other solution is just don't run that code. You know, the, the Oracle gurus will tell you, just don't do it. You know, and, and there's a bit of logic in that. We commented out a lot of code. And by commenting out code, the system started to run faster and better. This was an indication that if we eliminate function calls, we get much better performance. So we took some of the views, we cloned them, we out-commented the things that we thought were not no longer in use, and lo and behold, the system ran better. Who, who, you guys are code people, right? How often do you improve a system by just commenting out stuff? It's great. I, I loved it. It, it. it was, one, it helped. It helped us. And two, it was the perfect indicator that we, we did have a business case, a use case, for a function result cache. Um, so yeah, less we got less frequent calls. We got much faster reports. We eliminated some of the M views. We were quite happy with this, actually. And uh, the, the other problem, of course, is if you mess with somebody else's code, and we messed with the views, basically, we went into the views, just commented out columns in the views, uh, you create maintenance for future, because what will happen in future is on the next deployment, somebody will press the button, will regenerate those views, and the formatting and all the clever stuff that goes on in the views, and then I have to go in and out comment the columns again. You know, by messing with somebody's code, I create a maintenance nightmare. So, not ideal, but it did help. This was what we called our second solution. The first one, we wanted function result cache. This helped as well. There was a third solution. Basically, commenting out, eliminating code, is we did that here. So, you comment out columns in the views that you think are expensive, or that you know are expensive, and that you think, suspect, and verify that are no longer needed. Basically, you put your comments here. It helped. It wasn't ideal. And maintenance nightmare. So the third solution, what we came across, was can we bypass something? Remember that complex slide with all the layers where the arrows go down? Uh, yeah, you go and find your data directly. Don't use too many views. Try to eliminate the packages. You know, Go for the heavy reports. Critical high-frequency stuff. Oracle will tell you which queries are fired frequent and which objects get a lot of queries on them. Uh, Heli may have told you, and the tool to use is AWR or OEM if you're familiar with that, or Lab128 if you're familiar with that. But your AWR reports will tell you more or less where your hotspots are. You can use that. Uh, so we recode some of the logic and bypass those layers. Uh, it's expensive because it's manual work. You have to figure out what you need to bypass. Uh, you are going to do hard-coded stuff. You're outsmarting the application, meaning on the next deployment, you need to outsmart it again, but still. Yeah. 
uh, you, you create a maintenance nightmare. Basically. Uh, we did that. So in this particular diagram, what we did is we took those reports, we figured out what was in the report, we figured out where it was in the data, and we, we just bypassed the whole thing. We ended up having to uh, join a lot into those object little things here. And this, this is the view with the 136 tables underneath, remember? And uh, the funny thing is, that there's another presentation that goes deeper into the architecture. This particular object, the view with the 136 tables, if you do a count on the view, 35,000 records. And, and then, <laughs> you know, how much is 35,000? That fits in a spreadsheet. You know, but, yeah. Um, go back to the first solution and the result case. This is the clever stuff, the duct tape, really. I hate my own echo. Um, so the challenge is the data will change, the system is in use, uh, how are we going to cache that? You cannot really touch the generated code because it's owned by somebody else. It's actually uh, a Nordic company. Um, in Finland, I know <laughs> there were people in the room who had helped build some of these concepts, which was quite interesting. Um, the clue that we had was if we eliminate stuff, we make it go faster. That was to us the best indicator that if we can use function result cache, we, we eliminate the same calls basically, but we have Oracle do it. We outsource the elimination to the Oracle system, much more efficient. A function result cache, it looked like an ideal use case, it didn't work. No. Um, I'm going to go very fast, I had planned to go faster through these slides. If you guys are Oracle, uh, how am I for time? If you guys are Oracle minded, you may want to study these slides a little. One of the messages is read the, read the fantastic manual. But the function result cache came in in Oracle 11, so it's about 10 years old by now. Um, you can cache queries and PL SQL functions in memory. It basically means you call a query or you call a function. Oracle determines this call has been done before with the exact same arguments. The whole thing is hashed. And I, I do hope and I think I know that the hash is reliable and say, oh, I've already done this, I know the result, I'll look it up in an array and I'll give it back to you. Thanks. So you end up with a separate cache somewhere in the SGA. It does not get into the buffer cache. I'll have a diagram of that. You can read that in the manual. Uh, there are two types. There is the server and there is the client result cache. I think I prefer the server to keep that. I, I don't really want to do anything on the client, but that's a bias that I have. And it's not and it's not covered in our system in our presentation. Uh, the query result cache uh, works on columns and rows. What you have is a query result cache will basically detect your query and say you've already done this query and here is your quick result. And the PL SQL function result is you've already called this function and here is your result. Same concept, slightly different implementations. Um, it uses the shared pool and not the buffer cache. So you have to may have to calculate the size of that space in the shared pool. Uh, the result, it works across sessions. And this is a caveat if you have uh, session specific stuff in your queries or in your users. Um, it you may, we have not found it, but we have worried that we would get wrong results if the same session did the same call, but uh, in a different context. And uh, a couple of Oracle guys have reassured me that you cannot possibly go wrong. I, I would like to see that sort of proven. But that on the one hand, I've never proven it to, re to retrieve any wrong results either, so I'm fine. Anyone interested in that? I'll add that next slide. Um, the result goes here somewhere in your shared pool, not in your buffer cache. So the data has already gone through storage, through the buffer cache, into that shared pool result cache. If you do if you call a function or a query that has a result cache on it, you are eliminating the code path here and, and the storage effort here. So it is, in theory, extremely efficient. A and it is, by the way. It works fine. And in our proof of concept, it worked perfectly. We were really happy with the proof of concept until we found it wouldn't work in practice. Um, the buffer cache, yeah, you guys know where the buffer cache is maybe. The actual result cache goes there. Uh, you have to calculate the size a little bit and, and determine what is a good size for your case. Um, uh, what I uh, will repeat this about seven times is read, read the manual. Um, 
if you execute a query, the result I it will search the result cache. If it finds it, it will pick it up from the cache. If it doesn't find it, it has to go through the code paths, uh, execute the query, retrieve the result from storage, get it in the buffer, keep it, and then put it in the result cache itself. And on the next call, it's in the result cache. I can I can talk about this for an hour. It's probably not worth it. Repeated execution, you basically have near zero work for the next call. And it th this is important. Oracle keeps track of the validation of that cache. If Oracle even suspects that the cache result is no longer valid, you have to retrieve the data again. And I've never found this at fault myself yet. I think it's fairly reliable. So I, I would trust it. I would use it. Um, it, it it's a nice fix. Maybe it's a fix for a problem you don't want to have, but you know developers will develop whatever they develop. So, and then this is one fix. Uh, there are some restrictions. You have to read the manual result cache for dummies. See, yeah. anyway, um, you have uh, it has to be a varchar, a number, or a date. You cannot cache blobs or uh, complicated variables out there. And uh, you, the query result cache cannot include dictionary stuff or sequences or date and time functions. Uh, it all makes sense if you think about it. And th there were the people who asked questions about it. Why is it limited? And I cannot really, well, I can partly answer that, but outside of the scope, basically. Um, there are, yeah, you please read the manual. There's a couple of more slides that tell you to read the manual. Uh, invoker writes not supported, pipelines not supported, in and out parameters don't work, lobs don't work, of course, ref cursors don't work. Um, fine, that's all in the manual. What we thought was particularly useful is don't use the, uh, the result cache mode force. Don't force it to use that mode. Uh, if you do, you probably end up with another CPU, explosion, CPU problem, and there's a, there's a few MetaLink documents about that. So and and we mean it. We tried it, and it just stops working. You know, it 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 doesn't return anymore, and you get a runaway CPU. You know. um, read the manual. I would say there is one. Uh, here it is. Don't don't use the force mode. Uh, undocumented stuff. Um, yeah, I I forgot most of this, by the way. But the the message was read carefully and don't use anything stupid. Uh, the package, you can look and you can flush the result cache manual, you can create reports on it. If you want to bypass it, you can ask for that, you can manually invalidate the cache. We haven't used any of this. There are control buttons and control uh, procedures you can use. I haven't really experimented with this. Anyone used the result cache and says something? Yeah? Would you... Um, we need to talk afterwards, you know, see what you, we might disagree on a few of these things. You may say something like, oh, this is a beautiful feature, maybe use it. But uh, be interested to hear. You know. the, uh, the views, of course, there are a few V dollar views that you can look at. Um, and this told us when it didn't work, it basically told us that we had nothing in the result cache. So we were baffled you know, until we found out. Again, you keep calm and use the manual. We thought we had the perfect set, so we put this result cache keyword in. Um, it could work on packaged functions. We, we verified that. Uh, the dependencies are tracked. There is a relies on, which is deprecated. Read the manual. And I, I haven't really checked for 12.2. Wouldn't be surprised if something's broken again. Uh, it is really effective if you frequently run the same query. If you have heavy query functions, if you have a function call that does a lot of work, consider caching it and avoid the work on the next call. Um, you, it, it works best if your data is relatively persistent. If the change rate is low, it makes perfect sense. You know, data that changes quickly uh, should be cached at point of change. This cache is one layer higher than the point of change. Make sense? Okay. If if you if you have something that changes quickly, you can keep it in cache. But make sure you keep it in cache at the point where it changes, so that every next query has the best, the most up-to-date result. You know, single point of truth, acid, atomic. Read up on acid. Okay. Um, anyway, we we had these things calling multiple function multiple times in one session. 
you can imagine that if you have a view where the column is a function and that column is in the where clause, it, it gets called a lot. Unintentional, really. You know, It's a byproduct of the way the application works. Um, so we went to work. Um, we have these get something functions, so use the view, uh, many small and efficient queries in the function. We had a lot of context switches for the Oracle guys, which makes it expensive. We had really good candidates for the function result set, uh, function result cache. Um, and we, we were inside the limitations, you know, when it didn't work, we were baffled. We so we studied the manual and we were fairly sure we were inside all the limitations. Um, we the queue didn't work. Okay. So we were here. Our problem was here. We have functions in these packages. We have them result cached and they don't work. Proof of concept, we tried it with packages, functions in the package, and result cache worked perfectly. You know, we were so happy. And then in, in our real case, it didn't work. What's happened? You know, this, we have functions here. We mainly queried that object view. So we had to go to this particular view. It wouldn't work. Any suggestions? You can s begin to suspect why by now. Okay. Okay, the other... Some of the other calls were fine, you know, calling views on single tables was not a problem. Calling the view on that huge object thing was a problem. And there's only 35,000 rows in this view, remember? It's a spreadsheet, it fits on a memory stick easily. And it's not a huge amount of data. Um, so yeah, that one. Uh, our case, so we have the function to get something. Inside the function we have multiple queries to the views. We have uh, fishing data out of the tables and then do some logic. A lot of the logic, annoyingly, is, is like uh, formatting and translation, you know, going from uh, Gaelic to English, that sort of thing, formatting stuff. Why it doesn't it work? Well, basically, we had too many dependencies. I think the next one summarizes that nicely. Uh, we get the function, so in the function we have some queries, uh, some extra queries, we return something, and the function. Under there, in, in the dependency of that package, are tables and views. So, DBA dependencies told us there's about 140 or so dependencies on the package, you know, and 136 are tho those union tables in the object view with only 35,000 rows in them. Um, and apparently, a function result cache stops working when you get above n dependencies. And uh, we, we did not, yeah, <laughs> and now people start to grin. Of course, that makes perfect sense because the, the, the database engine cannot keep track of too many dependencies. It has to invalidate the cache at the right point in time. And nobody could tell us what n was. So here's your quiz, you go home this evening and then tomorrow you mail me what you think is n. You know. You can do that by trial and error, or you can open a request <laughs> with Oracle, or you can look it up on the internet. And, uh, maybe it's out there by now. We, uh, we tested it. We had unions of tables with 2, 5, 10, 20, 30 tables. Uh, see which n breaks our system. Below a certain n, it works. Above a certain n, it doesn't work anymore. You hit the wall. Uh, we had our basic problem was uh, union with one, three, six tables in there. We always had a large number of dependents. Yeah. Now what? Uh, and to summarize it in a graph, we are here. We have a package with a function, calls a view, and the view has too many tables in there. You can see the solution in the graph already. Don't tell anyone yet. Okay, but basically we have too many underlying tables, uh, too many tables. What is n? And uh, next day, which we're like, now what? So Peter comes in the office next day, my colleague, and he says, okay, let, let's do this brilliant idea. Uh, we will create a number of small views with like, you know, 10, 15, or N tables in each view, and we'll start querying those, because we want one record or a few records from the object table we don't have to query the whole view at the same time. We can start by querying the most likely ones and then the least likely ones until we have a result. We can query less. We can create functions that fetch data from smaller parts. So we can split up the function in smaller functions with less dependencies. Hey. Yeah. And then when we have functions with less dependencies, we can then work the result cache. 
and we can even skip the stuff that we don't think we need anymore. Once we have the result, we can return the function, we can give the function the return value, and we don't have to query the rest of the tables anymore. So we, we save on two fronts, really. I'll show you in a moment. So we recoded the function to get some ID, and that would become get something one, get something two, get something three, you know, and then query smaller functions one by one until we find it. Uh, of course, you try the most likely, uh, you know, the most likely tables and views first, and with a bit of luck, you hit your result on the first try, and you're done. Is this? I know that this is c can be a bit difficult to explain, but who, if you don't understand it, come to me, and we'll draw it out on a piece of paper. I'll see if I can explain that again. Uh, what we have here, instead of doing a huge no, this is f it's always fails when you don't need it. Instead of doing 136 dependencies in the first function call, we make a few small functions, and each of them has less than n dependencies. So each of those functions, each of those functions can use the result cache. And cheese, it becomes fast. And even faster, because if I find it on the first attempt, I don't even have to go in. I find it on the first attempt, I don't have to go in the second and the third attempt anymore, I just don't need to query that to get my result anymore. So, correct, I split it, yeah. The main function is the same, and underneath are three or four different functions. And we, we take the most likely one first, so we hope to find it quick. If we can't find it quick, we search deeper until we find it, yeah. That's the idea. And, and you can apply this to just about any system, but um, and it, it wasn't, I, have, I cannot take the credit for this. I had a guy called Peter Sweer come back and say, maybe that will work. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. And, and like I said, we got a thank you mail from a Polish manager too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so we, it worked. We had it, less dependencies per function. Result cache worked. You can even avoid a number of calls if you find the data. So not only did my result cache work as advertised, I also got a lot less executed calls. I just had to do less work underneath anymore. Um, it is still a maintenance nightmare because we have tweaked the software and on the next release, we need to test and tweak the software again. You know, don't mess with other people's code. But, yeah. Um, so, oh, I got there. Am I? I'm probably way too early now because I've, uh, I should have spent more time reading the manual. Um, so, summary and tips. You know, function result cache. If you have the use case for it, it works brilliantly. I, I'm quite happy with it. And when they ask me, like, what is your favorite feature? I'm not going to say something like statistics on the optimizer because people will grow old and gray with the optimizer, but. I think this is my favorite uh, feature now, because I have a lot of applications that basically do too many calls, and this helps fix them. It's, it's relatively easy to use. In a number of cases, you can just swap in that keyword res result cache, and it works for you. It saves you a lot of CPU and I.O. So like, big like on Facebook. Uh, function is called, you have to configure it properly. Calculate the amount of space you think you need and reserve that in the shared pool. Uh, don't use the force keyword, you know, use with care, of course. Uh, check the restrictions. You know, if, if you return cursors, if you return sets, if your functions do anything um, that doesn't return a varchar or a number or a date, you're, you're still in trouble. You know, I, I cannot really fix that. Uh, and of course, my question to you is, can some of you find out what N is? You know? You never know. It's not that difficult. Yeah, go ahead. Huh? 42. 42. Uh, no. And we specifically tried. <laughs> we specifically tried that. <laughs> By the way. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, Oracle on Windows and Oracle on Exadata and Oracle on uh, VM running uh, Red Hat Linux all come up with the same N. And yeah, it's not so, so we, um, we think from, from these Polish guys who opened uh, a, an Oracle internal service request, we think it's actually a hard-coded limit somewhere. Yeah. And, and they came up with a number that was one less than what we thought it was, by the way. Uh, yeah. um, so there you go, the summary and tip, uh, tip number two. Uh, the other solutions, like uh, program your own cache, probably not a good idea. Eliminate code, I'm always in favor. You know, bypass 
complex queries, you'd have to decide for yourself whether you want to recode somebody else's application. Um, I personally, I, I don't like to rewrite somebody's code, and there is a lot of clever stuff in there. I, when I had the, the Cheto guys in the room, I was like, I'm not criticizing what you built. You know, I have a lot of respect for the, the richness and the complexity of that application, and I'm actually in favor of putting that complex stuff in the database and not having it in, in, in JavaScript or Python or uh, the Perl. Anyone used Perl? Perl? <coughs> Great tool, Perl. I, I will never maintain your code, though. It's unreadable, okay? But, but if it's PL SQL, I can at least find it and read it. So I'm, I'm really in favor of putting stuff in the database. You know, thick database is not a bad concept if you want to discuss that. Um, like I said, I don't want to criticize a good concept. This thing could do things that I had not held possible. You know, it would actually present the Polish users with Polish language interfaces all the time. And that's part of the... Uh, anyway. Uh, if you mess with this test, 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 and test early. If you build something, and this, this code was 10 years old or so, and they had never counted on having so many records in there, you know, and, and it was only the main tables were a couple of million records, nothing major, really. It just broke because of all the CPU work. It did too much work per record, per unit, really. Um, if you build a system, test it, test it early, and test it realistic. Do some volume testing. You know, unit testing doesn't cut it alone. Integration testing is useful, but you should probably think through your volumes as well. Do some sizing, do some unit, do some size testing, some volume testing. Um, think about your usage, uh, and, and if you can eliminate database work, that's even better. You know, one, do your work in the database, and then two, try to eliminate the work anyway. Uh, another one, no, try to monitor what your system does. It would have helped us if this system kept count of what it did. You know, there was no, no real diagnose stuff included in this code. If code has something that reports and says we're using this package uh, a million times per hour, that would have been useful to us. We had to figure that out ourselves. Um, and whatever you code and deploy, you know, evaluate from time to time. Am I still doing the right thing? You know, you don't take my word for it. You can read my blog. You can. Uh, this is my real question. How many of you think that they are able to find n? Any any of you ambitious enough to go and test this or look it up? Okay. Well, mail me if you find it. Um, uh, whatever you do, if you build something that complicated, uh, maybe think again. It is, for me, as a troubleshooter, it is easier if you keep it simple, really. And think about it. If your system has to be maintained, like the, the guy from Ukraine said this morning in the keynote, you, not, you don't build for hack anymore. You know, you build for maintenance. And there's a bit of a lesson in there. I thought that was a really good keynote. Yeah. Um, there is a German poet who says something like, you know, the limitation shows the master. If you do only simple things and keep your customers happy, that's probably better than hacking something really complicated and having me fix it, uh, having my colleague fix it afterwards. Uh, he's the guy who said, uh, limitation shows the master. It's my favorite quote. He got it. Oh, if you cannot explain it quickly, it's probably not good enough. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it either. Yeah. Um, questions? This is where I ask, how am I doing for time? I think I'm on time. This time. My question to you, N, you know, <laughs> find out, and maybe somebody comes to me after the thing and says, oh, it's that, I know that, I had it. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, anyone? Yeah. Shoot me. <laughs> hmm? no, I mean, yeah, shoot me. Yeah. You can shoot me. I'm, I'm done. If, if there is time, one of my other favorites is this one. If you ever need to fix a, a system in problem, you can eliminate stuff. Just don't use the code. Code, uh, comment it out. You can optimize it. You know, do your statistics and stuff like that. And people have built careers on the statistics of Oracle. But it is a problem that I really would rather not have. You know, Statistics. So Contain it, run it less frequent, doesn't work. You know, you cannot really fix a problem by not running it. It will come back and haunt you, anyway. 
uh, you can try to kill it with iron and sometimes that works and you can almost predict what happens if you put something from a CPU burning VM on an extra data and I told the Polish people it'll be about three times faster so when you have a screen that takes a minute to load it'll go back to 20 seconds and they called us and said how did you know it would go back to 20 seconds and well you know iron and ex the extra data was exactly three times faster than the VM they had before and it was purely CPU limited I could predict what their timing would be and it, it gave them the confidence oh this guy these guys can probably fix it yeah. Um, so if you, if you know your hardware, if you know you will only have like 50 users and you can get enough hardware, you, you can kill it with either, you can get an extra data. But if you really don't know what your users will be in the next three months or six months or a year, then fixing something with more iron probably doesn't help. Uh, Dynamic SQL never gets fixed with hardware. Any anyway, we got it. And I'm, I'm through. Basically, this is my last slide. But uh, any questions? Okay, I cannot say like let's go for dinner because there's one more session. Uh, after me, that is Marcin instead of Camille. Check. And that was the uh, the housekeeping thing I had to tell you. So there's a schedule change. What else? Do I have like uh, half an hour left or something? <laughs> this was my story. Um, you know, discussions over coffee. Yeah.